Hi everyone, my name is Xiang Zhang. Um, I'm a PhD student from the University of Utah. So today I will be presenting our paper called A Novel Multi-Agent Deep Reinforcement Learning Enabled Distributed Power Allocation Scheme for Millimeter Wave Cellular Networks. So this is a joint work with Dr. Bowen, uh, Professor Kesar, and Professor G. So first, um, I will provide a brief overview of reinforcement learning. And then we'll talk about some several um, specific uh, algorithms called DD, Deep Deterministic Policy Gradient, and then and, uh, also a model agent version of DDPG. Then we propose a distributed version of MADDPG, and then we finally we present the proposed power allocation scheme. So here's a brief overview of reinforcement learning. So, um, in reinforcement learning, uh, agent agent interact with the environment by making actions based on the state or observation of the environment. When after it make it, uh, makes actions, it receives rewards, which implies how good the action is. So the basic mass uh, under the reinforcement learning is called Markov decision process. So MDP can be represented by a quadruple ASRT. Here, A is the action space and S is the state space or observation space. R here is a reward function and T is a problem, is a state transition probability function. So an experience is just a quadruple of the current state, action, reward, and the next state, okay? A policy mu is, is just a function that maps the state to a specific action. So our goal is to find a policy that maximizes the accumulated reward uh, of the agent through time. So the Q function here, um, given a st specific state and action pair, I say is defined as, as this here, shown in this equation. So we can see, so here, remember that R here is just the reward, uh, reward at time T. So we can see that Q, I say, is just the, uh, um, weighted sum of the reward over time if the agent starts from a specific action and state pair S and A here. So gamma here is called discount factor, which kind of implies how important uh, the reward is in the near and far future. So our objective is to uh, maximize the total accumulated reward, as I have said previously. So the objective function G here is just defined as expected uh, Q function over all possible states. So here, rho mu here is the stationary uh, state distribution of the MDP if we follow a specific policy mu. So our goal is to maximize this objective function. So deterministic policy gradient or oh, DPG for short is a popular algorithm that uses a deterministic policy. A deterministic policy just means that, okay, each state will be mapped to a specific action with prob probability one. So usually um, the, the uh, policy will be parameterized by a parameter theta. And then in order to optimize the objective function, we can use gradient ascent to opt to find the optimal parameter. So alpha here is just a learning rate. Okay, deep DPG is a new algorithm that utilizes the power of deep neural nets. So it replaces, uh, represents the, uh, the policy or sometimes it's also called actor and the Q function, which is also uh, sometimes referred to as critic. Uh, so DDPG actually uses deep neural nets to represent the actor and the critic. Okay, so in this case, so the theta parameter theta will just be the weights and the biases of the deep neural nets. Okay, uh, this is just the uh, the basic architecture of DDPG. So the actor, uh, which is the uh, which is the policy will be represented by a neural network with which uh, with weights denoted by theta mu, and the critic is uh, represented by another deep neural nets with weights theta q. So we can see the input, there's only one input, which, which is a state to the actor, and it then it outputs the action. 
Okay, but for critic network, it has two inputs, which is uh, state and action, and then it outputs the uh, queue function here. So, uh, in order to train the actor and the critic networks, two tricks are usually used. The first is called the experience replay buffer. Okay, remember when I said the experience is just a quadruple of an agent, right? So the experience replay buffer which is a buffer that stores all the past experiences uh, 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 for that agent. And then we can sample mini batch of data, experience data from the replay buffer to train this actor and the critic networks. This is a pretty a standard process. I, I will not uh, go into the details here. And then the second trick, trick is called the target networks. Okay, so the target networks it's just copies of the original actor and critic network networks. But this the widths of the target networks are less frequently updated. So the reason to use these networks is just to stabilize the training process. Okay, so far what we have talked about is for the single agent setting, where which means there's only one agent in the network. Okay. Um, but uh, when we consider multi-agent systems, there are some challenges, uh, which basically the state transition of the environment in a multi-agent setting is determined by the joint actions of all agents, right? So how do we solve this problem? So of course, a very straightforward way is to consider a centralized MDP where we kind of view the agents, uh, the multiple agents as a single super agent whose action and state space is just a product uh, of the individual action and the observation space of the each agent. But the problem with, one, with this one is that the, the state or action space can be exponentially large when the number of agents increase, which the, which the complexity we cannot handle with a large number of agents. Also for some on privacy considerations. So usually one agent is prevented from knowing the actions of other agents. So in this case, um, the there will be a non-stationarity issue. So uh, this is because let's think about for one agent. So the environment is determined by the joint actions of all agents, but that one agent doesn't know the actions of all other agents. So therefore, the state trend, uh, environment state transition will be kind of non-stationary, which means that it may change over time from that one agent's perspective. So this validates the basic MDP assumption. To overcome this issue, uh, 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 the multi-agent DDPG or MADDPG algorithm was proposed. The key inside of MADDPG is that the local environment seen by each agent will be stationary if other agents' actions are fixed. So no matter what kind of policies are used by them. So to this uh, purpose, so it, uh, I mean, DDPG defines a new Q function as shown in this equation here. Uh, as we can see, the Q function not only depends agent as action, but also depends on other agents' action as shown in the last part. So in this case, the agent will need to know each agent will need to know, need to know the other agent's actions. So usually, uh, in a multi-agent setting, the global state S usually consists of multiple observations from each agent. Okay, and so the the Q function defined in the MADDPG requires the knowledge of the actions of other agents. So therefore, uh, they use a centralized training distributed execution or CTD framework to do this. Okay, so the actor and the critics are trained in a centralized manner, which means that there's a replay buffer that collects the experience of all different agents and put the, put it, put the data together. And then each agent will grab some data from the centralized replay buffer and then train its own actor and critic networks. Of course, this will um, increase some communication overhead. So, but the actions are made distributedly. This means that each agent will only choose its uh, will choose its action will based only its local observation. OI here as shown in this equation. 
Okay, so the the in particular the process is like that in each time step. So the agents, the replay buffer will collect the experiences from each agent, and then the agent will periodically grab data, many batches of data from the replay buffer to train its critic and uh, and actor networks. Okay. Um, for MADDPG, there could there still could be some challenges, which is that uh, when there's a large number of agents in the network, okay, so because the queue function of each agent depends on the actions and observations of all the agents in the network, okay, so uh, the input size to the actor and the critic network will be very large. So this will make the training of the deep neural nets very slow. And also, as we can see, uh, see later, so it is unnecessary to let all agents share information. So for example, in our millimeter wave power allocation task here, let's consider two base stations. If they are very far from each other, there will be little interference between them. Okay, this just means that one base station will have negligible impact on the state transition of the other base station, right? So in this case, it is just not necessary to uh, let these two base stations share information with each other because they have no impact on each other. So based on this observation, we just propose a distributed version um, uh, of MADDPG, which, called the, which is called distributed MADDPG or distributed CTD framework. So in this case, in this scheme, so the actor and the critic networks are trained over subsets of the agents, okay? So of course, there could be some benefits. For example, the communication and the com computation overhead can be reduced. Um, but what is good is that our scheme can also capture the essential features of the environment. Okay, so for this purpose, we define a new uh, uh, Q function for each agent I as shown in this equation. So as we can see, besides the observation and the action of agent I, so this Q function also is also conditioned on the observation and actions of the agents in a neighbor set of agent I. So NI here is just a neighbor set of agent I. So usually this is a small number. This includes a small number of base stations or agents. So now let's look at the power proposed power allocation scheme. So our goal here is to maximize the throughput, uh, throughput of the network and then each base station is subject to a maximum power uh, constraint. Okay, so let's see how can we define the action reward and the observation uh, of the MDP. So in this modeling, we just treat each base station as an agent, which needs to determine the transmit power to its scheduled UE. So the action is pretty straightforward where uh, it's just a transmit power at in each time slot T. And the reward is defined as the total throughput of the network for each agent. Yeah, of course, um, this will in incur some small communication overhead because uh, the throughput has to be passed throughout the network um, to let each base station know this information. But this reward definition is intuitive and it avoids heuristic designs like very, which could be very complicated and non-intuitive. And then the most important part is the definition of the observation. Okay, so the observation just reflects each agent's perception of the radio environment, right? So it needs to be carefully designed in order to capture the essential features of the environment. So this is uh, one, one of the major novelties of this paper. So in particular, base station I's observation OI at time T consists of two parts. So the first part contains some information about base, base station I itself. And the second part contains some information from the neighbor set. Okay, let's look at uh, how this was defined. Now for the first part, okay, it's defined in this equation. Let's see uh, what the elements are. The first element is the transmit power of uh, base station I in the previous slot. And then the second part is the direct channel gain in the previous slot. 
So here, the notation GI here is just a, a direct channel from base station I to its scheduled UE. So this is a product of the pass loss and the antenna gain at the receiver and the transmitter and the small scale fading, okay? We also uh, include the direct channel gain at the red beginning of the current slot, okay? And then the fourth term is the uh, total interference measured in the previous slot at base station I. So this can be measured at the base station I scheduled UE and then feedback to base station I. And the next term is just a total interference at the beginning of the current slot T. Okay, so this is because, uh, this part is because we have assumed that the channel changes at the red beginning of each slot but the power has not de determined in this case. So therefore, each base station can measure a new inference too. And then the last two terms, which is the uh, throughput of base station I in the previous slot. And then the last element is the throughput of base station I in the previous slot over the total throughput of, uh, of the base stations in the neighbor set uh, of course, including base station I in the previous slot. So this in uh, this uh, quantity here just represents a contribution of base station I to the sum throughput among its neighbor set. And then the second part. So the first element in the second part is just the inference from measured from neighbor G here. So neighbor G here is just uh, uh, from uh, from base station G. So G here is just a base station from the neighbor set of base station I. Then we also include the inference from neighbor G at the red beginning of the current slot T. Okay, as you can see, the channel has changed, but the power has not been changed, updated yet. Then we also include the throughput of base station G. As we can see, the first two entries here can be directly measured at base station I, but this throughput term has to be transmitted from base station J to base station I. Of course, this will incur some uh, if, uh, some communication overhead, but as long as the size of the neighbor set is fixed, so this information exchange overhead doesn't skew with the number of total number of agents in the network, which makes our scheme scalable. And now let's look at the experiments. So we implemented our proposed scheme with PyTorch. So the actor and the critic networks all have the same sizes, which contains three hidden layers, which contains 200, 150 neurons at each layer respectively. So the neighbor set of each base station is just chosen as the six closest base stations. So other parameters of this experiment is shown in this table. So we compare our scheme with two baseline scheme, which is called uh, weighted minimum mean square error scheme and the fractional pro uh, programming scheme. So these two are both centralized and state of the art schemes for power allocation. So both of these schemes require uh, perfect no knowledge of the all the channels in the network. So in each slot, we run 2000 iterations for these two schemes to obtain a stationary power allocation. So we first uh, experiment with a base station with, with a, a network with four base stations. So here, um, uh, each base station is associated with three UEs, but only one UE is scheduled at a time. So UEGI just means uh, denotes uh, G's UE of base station I. So we have three different configurations, which reflects different interference conditions. For example, in the first uh, con uh, configuration, when the zeros UEs of each base station is scheduled, we see that the beams are overlapped in this case, which means there's very strong interference among base stations. And then we, when the second UEs are scheduled, uh, the beams kind of kind of more spread out, this, which represents a weaker interference scenario. Then for the purpose of testing, we consider uh, an omnidirectional uh, case where the antennas are omnidirectional. So when the first UEs are scheduled. Okay, so this plot here just shows the average throughput per base station um, as time goes. So each point on the curve is just a moving average of the previous one, 100 slots. 
So here, this purple curve is our proposed scheme. And then this yellow curve is WMSE. And then the top, uh, the blue curve at the top is FP. We also have the random power allocation and the full power, maximum power allocation. We can see that our um, scheme actually converges in around 40,000 slots and achieves higher throughput than the both baselines. Okay, here. So the reason that our scheme goes from low to high is that the use of the exploration noise. So we, in order to explore at the early stage of the training, uh, of the learning, so we just add a, add a Gaussian IID noise to the output of the actor network. So, but the, that Gaussian noise has zero mean, but the variance will be decreasing over time. When there is a good solution, a power allocation is found by the algorithm. So the variance will decrease to very small number until to zero. This also explains why there's less fluctuations as, the, as time goes for the proposed scheme. And then this is the results for the other two configurations. We can see that our scheme actually achieves better, uh, still achieves better performance than the two baselines. And then we experiment with a larger network with eight base stations. So in this case, for example, for base station zero, it will have three neighbors, which is base station one, base station five, and base station four. Okay. So uh, the left figure actually uh, plots the uh, throughput uh, as time goes. This is called the training phase where uh, the actor and the critic networks are trained periodically. And then we also do a testing phase where we use the policy learned from the training phase and then apply this policy to the same network but with a different channel realization and then uh, just plots the empirical CDF of the different schemes. We can see that our scheme, which is a purple curve, achieves very close performance to the WMSE, which is slightly worse than the FP in, uh, on the right. This just shows that our scheme is robust to um, channel change. Okay, remember that uh, these two baselines are centralized schemes, which means that the which means that they require the knowledge of all channels in the network. But our scheme, we only require a limited now, a limited amount of information from neighboring base stations. Okay, to summarize, in this uh, work, we have proposed a distributed version of MADDPG algorithm, where a subset of base stations are sharing with each other, which reduces communication and also computation complexity. We defined a novel observation space and that captures the essential features of the environment for each base station. And uh, through the experiments, it is seen that our scheme can beat state-of-the-art schemes like WMSE and FP. Okay, thank you. Any questions?